Scrooge awoke in his own bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it, and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's time or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkey, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy estate, upon the couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping around the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the likes of me before. Never. Have never walked forth with the younger generation, members of my family, meaning, for I am very young. My older brothers, born in these later years, paused the phantom. I don't think I have. I'm afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for, spirit. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you ought to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room and its contents all vanished instantly and they stood in the city street upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays, but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed poorly out, but in twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and made a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged his fork into the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now the smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and knew it was for their own. And basking in luxurious thought of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although the collar nearly choked him, blew the fire until the potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got into your precious father, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha wasn't late last Christmas by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hooray, there is such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away again this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. 
Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes, darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declination in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church, and he'd come home rampant. Not coming on Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchit hustled tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did Tim behave, asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content? As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day who made beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this and trembled even more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to the stool beside the fire. And while Bob turned up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the t potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in the tiny corner at the table. Two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon their posts. Cram spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hooray! There never was such a goose. Bob said they didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed as mrs cratchit said with great delight surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish they hadn't it hadn't eaten it all at last yet every one had had enough and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onions to their eyebrows. But now the plates changed by Miss Belinda. Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have gotten over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose a supposition at which two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. 
Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other and the laundress next door to that. That was the pudding. In half an hour, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding. Like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of a half of a quarter of ignited brandy and belight with Christmas holly stuck in the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had doubts about the quality of the flour. Everyone had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put on the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth and what Bob Cratchit called a circle. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as any golden goblet would have done. And Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnut on the fire spluttered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily on hearing his name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, she said, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do. Poor fellow. My dear, said Bob, smiled answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake. And the days, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very happy and very merry, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim was last of all. He didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times more merrier than before. From the mere relief of Scrooge, the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them that he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter being a businessman. And Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire between the collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investment he should favor when he comes upon a receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked at a stretch and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter 
at which Peter pulled up his collar so high you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. At this time, the chestnuts in the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost little child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of a high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from waterproof and their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and in fact very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet at the spirit's sprinkling of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eyes upon them, and especially Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge as the scene vanished to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize his own nephew and to find himself in a bright gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at the same nephew. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he. And their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, cried Scrooge's nephew, he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They're always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, and all kinds of good little dots around her chin that melted into one another when she laughed. And the sunniest pair of eyes ever saw in a little creature's head although she was what you would have called provoking, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't miss too much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, and interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everyone else said the same thing, and they must be allowed to have a competent judge because they had just had dinner, and with dessert upon the table were clustered around the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had an eye on Scrooge's niece's sister, for he had answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no doubt to exp right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea, they had some music. They were a musical family and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or catch. I can assure you, especially Topper, who would growl away in bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face over it. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played forfeit. For it's good to be children sometimes and never better than at Christmas when its mighty foundler was a child himself. There was a first game at Blind Man's Bluff, though, and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe that he had eyes in his boots because the way in which he went about after the plump sister in the lace tucker, which was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down firearms, tumbling over the chairs, 
bumping into the piano, smothering himself against the curtains. Wherever she went, there he would be. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch himself anywhere else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would he would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes or No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He, only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an anim animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked upon the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anyone and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every new question to him, the nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was charged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It is your Uncle Scrooge, which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment though some objected that the reply, is it a bear, ought to have been yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become a gay and light of heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an audible speech, but the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes were visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close by home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was made rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in miseries, every refuge, where vain men in his brief authority has not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about for the ghost and saw it no more.
Remembering the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifting up his eyes, Scrooge beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and misery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any spectre I have known. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and to do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city seemed rather to spring up about them. But there they were in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said the fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with the large chin. Company, perhaps? He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones and greasy offal were bought by a grey-haired rascal of great age who sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone be second, and let the undertaker's man alone be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's the chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell? What have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber, said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. 
Mrs. Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for general agreement, said, No, indeed, ma'am. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying gasping out there, his last, alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Whose else's do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and fine one too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it, if it hadn't have been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this ha unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene had changed. And now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed. And on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this plundered man unknown. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death or this dark chamber, spirit, will be ever present to me. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework. But surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had the Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her head up to her face. The colour hurts my eyes, she said. The colour. Oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight. And I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. I have known him walk in with... I have known him walk in with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often, and so have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, Father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them, 
and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was with the covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed to him a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the thing that will be, or the shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed down towards the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone the neglected of the neglected grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit, oh no, no, spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, may I sponge away the writing on this stone? Holding up his hands, in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own, the bed was his own, the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own, to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling down to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was whole hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. It is? Go and buy it. 
Walker, exclaimed the boy. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a do joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He could never have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him off short in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. He dressed himself all in his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, they were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with the mistress. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in his waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family. 
and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle, and ever afterwards, as it was always said of him, that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us, and so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.